were successful in publishing this study in a peer review journal. Um, the context, when we talk about the atlas heart, um, basically we know that the heart is a specialized muscular tissue. And like all muscles, we'll expect some kind of changes when you exercise. This is the summer time now, and um, a lot of young lads go to the gym to tune up their muscles and get a big buck <laughs> for the season. We expect similar changes again with the heart. Um, but basically, in the scientific literature, the concept of cardiac adaptation to exercise is that it follows um, a dichotomous pattern in the sense that on one spectrum, the heart of an athlete um, exhibits a balanced kind of hypertrophy where there's an increase in dimension and increase in wall thickness. And um, this is what we see in endurance trained athletes. A typical example is uh, Mufara in the Olympic year with his glory flag there flying. And um, on the other spectrum, we have what we call um, um, co concentric hypertrophy, which is exhibited by strength trained athletes. In this scenario, there's a disproportionate increase in wall thickness. So the heart gets thicker, but it does not really get bigger. Um, in physiology, the mechanism that underpins these changes is said to be a volume overload and a pressure overload. But we'll not go deeply into that. Um, where this concerns us much is that if you look down here, there are some pathological conditions in the heart that can also exhibit these findings. And we are really very concerned about that. Um, the other thing that comes to our mind again, why this becomes important is, in the middle of this group, we have normal sedentary people who, people like you and me, just engage in our daily day-to-day -day activities, are not involved in competitive sports. And um, our findings has been that the nature of hypertrophy is between these two extremes. The landmark study that proposed this hypothesis is by a group called um, Morgan Roth and his group in 1975. As a matter of fact, this is um, the textbook teaching. And this is what underpins the screening guidelines that is used in kind of drawing a line between disease condition and normal condition. Disease condition and physiological adaptation to, uh, um, of the heart to exercise. Uh, most cardiologists really have to use these guidelines in screen at least for any event. What is in the mind of a cardiologist is we don't want a tragic situation called sudden cardiac death. We don't want a situation where a young athlete, hale and hearty, collapses in the middle of his spouse. So if we cast our mind to the incidence of sudden cardiac death, it is not an uncommon condition. Because here in the UK, as much as 12 to 19 people die every week. This is not very different from other parts of the world. And then um, it does involve high profile, high profile athletes, where you see the kind of publicity that goes with it. And then um, there's no age boundary, children, everybody or anybody can also be involved. Um, one case that comes to mind recently is uh, Fabrice Mwamba. He's a Premier League player, and um, in the midst of the whole world, under the global searchlight, he collapsed and he had a heart attack. And for about 78 minutes, his heart was not working. So it was actually one of the miracles of science that there was a cardiologist on the pitch that jumped in and persevered in saving his life. And then uh, this is a different member now with a, a doctorate hat from the uh, University of Bolton. So it's something good has come out of this because he's now wearing this glorious hat, which some of us are looking forward to one day. Um, now, when it comes to screening and looking at the difference between pathology and physiology, the difference between normal adaptation and pathological conditions, what comes to our mind is this. Here, that cell shows the atlas heart. And then um, there's an overlap because the heart gets bigger and it does get thicker. And there are disease conditions where the heart is also bigger and thicker. So there's an overlap. There's a gray zone where the cardiologist finds it difficult to make up the mind on what am I dealing with here. 
Is this pathology or is this physiology? A number of cases you find that this gray zone can become quite big as this, and um, it can also become smaller depending on the population and the sensitivity of the screen algorithm. This screen algorithm, as I said earlier, was proposed based on Morgan Roth's hypothesis. So the questions that arise is this. The Morgan Roth study was done in 1975. That's 35 years plus. Does it still stand? Secondly, if we look at the study done by Morgan Roth and his group, it's a landmark study. But the equipment that was used was ultrasound. Cast our mind back to what ultrasound was like in 1975. We can relate it to what television was like in those days. It was basically black and white. So the resolution was not what we can compare with what we have today. Today now, we have um, echocardiography has improvements in technology. We also have a magnetic resonance imaging. And we're talking about 3D image and 4D. We now have high tech ultrasound machines and um, um, 40 MRI scanners as well, that the images they get are not comparable with what we've had earlier on. In the scientific literature, there's been lots of controversies over particularly how the heart adapts to exercise in resistance-trained athletes. And there's been questions, different studies have come up with different answers. And a number of times, they are all small, small studies. There have also been previous meta-analysis looking at these issues, but the results were actually inconclusive. So the other um, third question that also arises is the impact of body size. How do we relate somebody who is very, very big, six-footer, with somebody who is small? What do we expect of the dimensions of the heart? And is it right to use the same screening algorithm? If we're going to correct for size, how do we correct for size? In other words, is a big heart a better heart? There's a need to normalize data. So these are the things that prompted our re-evaluation of this hypothesis, wanting to look at how to collect this data together. There are small sample studies, but we really need to be very um, scientific in making sure that we are not putting apples and oranges together. We have to make sure that we control for differences and heterogeneity, and make sure that the studies we are looking at are actually answering the same question. So we set out on a study where we looked at prospective trials uh, our data was extracted by two independent researchers. Uh, we sourced data from electronic database, looking at these databases. We also looked at reference list of previously published data and did a cross-reference search of these uh, papers. Um, in a few cases, we had to make contact with um, experts in the field for unpublished data or where data was not complete. Our study selection were for echocardiography and magnetic resonance studies between 1975 and 2012. We looked at male athletic populations between the ages of 18 and 45. We excluded female athletes, master athletes, and combined sports, or cases where there were steroids and uh, cases where there were disease conditions. This was because we wanted to make it a very homogeneous, tight group, as I said earlier, to control for heterogeneity. Um, part of what we also had to do was to use the strobe statement and the prisma statement as a guideline to strengthen the observation of these um, studies. Um, this diagram here shows the flow diagram of the literature filtration process. We entered this study with about 400 plus clinical trials at different levels from the title, the abstract, to when we had to extract the paper. We have an inclusion line and a filtration line. And at the end of it, we applied our checklist and we came down to 92 trials with over 4,000 subjects. These were included in the quantitative synthesis. The specific measures that we looked at were the structure of the heart. We looked at the function. We also looked at, we compared what data we have from echocardiography and MRI. We also looked at the impact of body size, knowing that we had to scale and how do we scale for body surface area. Uh, we chose a mixed effect random meta-analysis and our p-value was set at less than or equal to 0 0.05. So we did come up with some very interesting um, results. I will just uh, emphasize on this section. Um, when we looked at the structure of the heart, 
when we looked at the mass of the heart, we did see that the athlete groups had higher values compared to the control group. Um, we did see that the cavity dimension was wider or higher in endurance strain group. However, when we looked at the resistance strain group, the heart was not thicker. This, in essence, is against the, what we said was the dichotomous pattern. This, in essence, kind of conflicts with a part of Morgan Ross hypothesis. Part of it agrees because the endurance heartless exhibited bigger cavity and bigger dimension. But the part B that said that the wall thickness is thicker in resistance atlas was refuted by our study. Um, we look at the function and we saw that overall function was normal and we saw a higher stroke volume in endurance strain atlas. What this does kind of challenge is the Morgan Ross hypothesis. This is challenging textbook knowledge. This is challenging the basis of the screening algorithms that is being used to delineate between normal and abnormal. And we do think that this is a very, very important finding. So the take home message from what we've done is that we've seen that upper limits of chamber dimensions is exhibited by, by endurance trained athletes. Um, we've also seen that a lack of concentric hypertrophy in weightlifters and resistance trained athletes. And overall, we were also relieved that we saw normal geometry in people like you and me who are not competitive um, athletes. So as I said earlier, it prompts a re-evaluation of the Morgan Rhodes hypothesis. Um, and if I recap, this gray zone, this area overlap of overlap between the atlas heart and the disease conditions, we're hoping that with our findings and with the need now to do more to study this subject area, we'll be hoping to narrow the gray zone and make it tighter. If possible, we would like to obliterate it. We would like to reassure an athlete that if you are screened, you are screened. That means we are looking at 100% sensitivity of the test. That if we cut you out and you are safe, then you are safe to go ahead with your sport. We don't want situations like Fabrice Mamba having been tested or anybody to fall out from the net and experience sudden cardiac death. Um, presently, we now we are looking at um, since we have these uh, new technologies, we are also looking at everything about the heart. We are looking at the different chambers. We are looking to see what novel techniques can tell us more about the cardiac phenotype. And um, here at Liverpool John Moore University, we have a novel equipment which has actually um, helped us to churn out a lot of publications trying to work hard towards this um, achieving our aim of reducing that overlay, reducing that gray zone. Um, post this investigation, this uh, meta-analysis, we have also have a series of uh, publications that's come up after that. Thank you very much. <laughs>